Hello, everyone. I am Salil Badan, a computer science faculty member at Harvard, and I'm going to tell you about a new project called OpenDP. What is OpenDP? It is a community effort to build trustworthy open source software for differential privacy. I'm joined in leading OpenDP by my faculty colleague, Gary King, who is a political scientist and statistician, Merce Krosis, the chief data science and technology officer at Harvard's Institute for Quantitative Social Science, and James Honecker, our pri chief privacy engineer. Before OpenDP, let me provide some background on differential privacy. Differential privacy seeks to enable statistical analysis of data while providing privacy protections for individual level data. What do we mean by statistical analysis? This includes things like publications of statistical tables, training machine learning models, and generating synthetic data sets that reflect statistical properties of the original data. We also include systems that field queries from external analysts, allowing them to perform custom, not previously anticipated analyses, like running a regression on variables of their choice. Statistical query systems are in use by both government agencies and industry as a means for allowing the public to study sensitive data. Here are examples from the, uh, include, that include survey data from the US Census Bureau, education data from the National Center for Education Statistics, genomic data from the National Institutes of Health, and search trend data from Google. So that is the kind of utility we want to provide. What about privacy? Why do we need this new concept of differential privacy? The reason is that traditional methods for protecting privacy are now understood to be inadequate and are vulnerable to worrisome attacks. Starting with the work of Sweeney in the late 90s, there are now numerous examples showing that removing so-called personally identifying information uh, often still leaves data sets vulnerable to re-identification, where an adversary can use auxiliary data sources to determine, still determine who is who in the data set. Even more surprisingly, releases of what appear to be simply aggregate statistics can be subject to severe privacy attacks. One example is what is called a database reconstruction attack, where an adversary reconstructs almost all of the sensitive data from the released numbers. The US Census Bureau ran internal experiments and determined that the billions of statistics they release from the 2010, released from the 2010 decennial census can be combined to carry out a database reconstruction, leading them to decide to adopt differential privacy for the current 2020 census. Another example is a membership inference attack where an adversary can determine with high st statistical confidence whether someone is in a sensitive data set or a subset of it. The possibility of such attacks led the NIH to take down some of the genetic statistics it was making available online. To hammer home this point, let's look at an example that Reddit users discovered a couple of years ago with Google Translate. At that time, if you answered, entered nonsense into Google Translate, like here, ag, 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 and so on, is not meaningful text in Somali, Google Translate would start spitting out passages from the Bible verbatim. How did this happen? Well, the language translation is done by a deep neural network with hundreds of millions of parameters that are formed by training over a huge corpus of text. Each of these is just a number, seemingly an aggregate statistic. But actually, it turns out that altogether, these parameters, these numbers, actually memorize some of the training data. This may not be a worry when it is passages of the Bible, but imagine a translation, translation system trained on personal emails or text messages. These attacks don't tell us that all hope is lost, only that we need to be very careful, even with allowing only statistical analysis and aggregate statistics. And we need a theory to guide us in understanding what is safe and what is not. How many statistics can we release and how accurately without being vulnerable to attacks like these? That is what differential privacy promises to offer. Differential privacy gives a way of being sure that individual level information cannot leak when releasing statistical information and is increasingly accepted as a very strong gold standard for privacy protection. The way it achieves this is by carefully injecting small amounts of random noise into statistical computations to hide the effect of each individual data subject 
while still allowing signal about the population or larger groups to come through. Let me give a taste of the kind of privacy protection that differential privacy provides. Imagine that we have a statistical query system, a curator interface uh, to analyze a sensitive data set like the one shown on the left here. Differential privacy considers an arbitrary adversary interacting with the system, an arbitrary individual in the data set that the adversary may be trying to extract information about, possibly by issuing deviously constructed queries. It requires that the adversary should not be able to tell the difference between the responses it receives and the responses it would have gotten if we remove that individual's data from the data set and possibly replace it with arbitrary other values. Okay, so from the adversary's point of view, it's as if that individual's data was not used at all. To give you a sense of how this very strong property can be achieved, consider a simple query that's asking what fraction of people in the data set have some property, like being blood type B and HIV positive. It turns out that we can achieve the differential privacy property by computing the true answer to this query and adding a small amount of random noise. Why? Well, notice that each individual's data can affect the true answer to this query by at most plus or minus one over n, where n is the number of individuals in the data set, because we're calculating a population fraction. So intuitively, if I add noise of magnitude that's slightly larger than one over n, I should be able to obscure the effect of each individual data subject. The key point here is that the amount of noise that we introduce vanishes as the size n of the data set grows. And in fact, it vanishes more quickly than the statistical sampling error we expect for a query like this, which only vanishes on the order of one over square root of n. So now let me say a tiny bit more about how the differential privacy property is formalized. We have seen that a differential privacy uh, curator interface should be randomized inject its own random noise to provide privacy. And now the requirement is that for every potential sequence of queries uh, that an adversary might issue, and every two data sets, D and D prime, that differ on one row, that is on one individual's data, the probability distribution of the sequence of answers seen by the adversary should be approximately the same under D and on, on, under D prime. Okay, how close these distributions are is given by the privacy loss parameter epsilon. The smaller epsilon is, the harder it is for the adversary to detect of any, the effect of any one individual, and thus the greater the, the level of privacy protection. The particular way in which the closeness is measured is shown here a multiplicative relationship between the probability distributions given by a factor e to the epsilon. And it's important um, at a technical level for differential privacy, but it won't be necessary for understanding the rest of this talk. Given that particular measure of how close uh, we require the probability distributions to be, it also guides exactly how we add noise uh, to protect privacy, the particular probability distribution of noise we should use, which again is too technical for this talk. But including it here just to point out that the amount of noise we introduce depends on the privacy loss parameter epsilon. The smaller epsilon is, that is the more privacy protection we want, the greater the amount of noise we need to introduce. Finally, it's worth commenting that what I've said so far is only for answering one query with differential privacy. An important feature of differential privacy is composition. We can reason about how the privacy loss accumulates when we answer multiple queries. And we can compensate for this by increasing the amount of noise we use to achieve the same overall level of privacy protection. For example, if we want to answer k queries with differential privacy, it turns out that it suffices to increase the magnitude of noise by a factor of approximately square root of k. 
These examples are just illustrating the simplest kinds of analyses that can be done with differential privacy, estimating counts or population fractions. However, there is now a huge literature showing that differential privacy is compatible with almost all forms of statistical analysis. This is a partial list from six years ago and the literature has only exploded in size since then. The algorithms can introduce noise in quite sophisticated ways uh, to achieve the differential privacy property, not just adding noise to the final result uh, as in the examples we saw before. In many cases, these results exhibit a phenomenon like what I described before where as the data set size grows, the noise introduced for privacy vanishes compared to the statistical uncertainty one would have in a standard non-private analysis. In addition to lots of advances on the science of differential privacy, we have seen a number of exciting deployments of differential privacy, starting with the US Census Bureau back in 2006, which also recently made the landmark decision to use differential privacy for all its public use projects from the current decennial census. There are also several product, uh, products and tools using differential privacy from large technology companies like Google, Apple, and Microsoft. These are all well-resourced organizations with lots of technical expertise to build specialized differential privacy systems for their own use cases. Unfortunately, it is currently difficult for smaller organizations to build differential privacy solutions on their own and adoption, wider adoption has been slow. From the research community, there have also been many wonderful advances on differential privacy tools, but these often stop at being research prototypes that are built by one group, don't integrate with differential privacy tools from other groups, and don't ever make the transition to trustworthy product production code. That, this is what motivated us to start OpenDP. With OpenDP, we are initiating a community effort, a community effort to build trustworthy and open source uh, suite of differential privacy tools that can be easily adopted by custodians of sensitive data to make it available for research and exploration in the public interest. The goal is to channel the many advances the differential privacy community is making on the science and practice of differential privacy. By working together, we can build software that is more trustworthy, provides greater utility and has larger impact. We can foster greater adoption of differential privacy to ad address compelling use cases, and we can provide an advanced starting point for custom differential privacy solutions where they are needed. In the other direction, I believe this effort will uncover many important and fundamental new questions for research on differential privacy. We envision the OpenDP software to be divided into an OpenDP Commons and a number of different OpenDP systems. The commons will be the community governed portion of, op of OpenDP, containing the core library of differentially private algorithms, as well as other general purpose tools and packages. The OpenDP systems will consist of end-to-end -end differentially private systems that will usually build, be built in a partnership to address a particular set of use cases and be governed more independently. We have already started building the first such system in partnership with Microsoft. And by definition, the OpenDP systems will make use of components from the OpenDP Commons once it exists. Conversely, we expect the efforts to build these systems will result in new or improved general purpose components to be contributed back to the Commons subject to community vetting. Here are the key elements we see for OpenDP which I will talk through one at a time. For use cases, we are focused on opening otherwise sequestered and siloed sensitive data to support scientifically oriented research and exploration in the public interest. This includes data shared in archival data repositories, which scientific researchers use to share data sets with each other for secondary reuse and replication. It includes government agencies making data available to support research and transparency, and it includes companies sharing data with researchers, such as in the recent Social Science One project, whereby Facebook shared data to support the study of how social media is used for manipulating elections. Given the current circumstances, we are also keen to find use cases where OpenDP software uh, can help enable the sharing of data to understand and combat the spread of pandemics like COVID-19. The first of these use cases, archival data repositories, is what our, brought our team 
uh, into this collaboration on data privacy to begin with. So let me tell you a little bit more about that. Specifically, nearly 15 years ago, my co-PIs, Mercy Croesus and Gary King, co-founded the Dataverse project, which developed a software infrastructure for data repositories that has 56 installations around the world across many different fields of study. However, like most data repositories, Dataverse repositories are not equipped to take on privacy sensitive data. Researchers depositing data must generally attest that there are no privacy concerns with their data sets. And in the few cases where sensitive data is accepted, it is not made available for download. Our goal is to use differential privacy to enable wider and safer sharing of sensitive data sets. The governance of OpenDP has several goals. First, to ensure that the software is trustworthy, and in particular has correct and secure implementations of differential privacy. For this, we have given serious thought to the vetting process for code contributions to OpenDP. We also want to build a diverse and inclusive community that gives all stakeholders a voice, and to this end, we were delighted at the level of attendance and engagement in our first OpenDP community meeting in May. Finally, building on our successful partnership with Microsoft, we aim to have extensive collaborations with academia, industry, and government, and need our governance model to help facilitate and manage these relationships. For the core library of differentially private algorithms in OpenDP, we have been working with Marco Gabori and Michael Hay, who are experts in programming languages and databases aspects of differential privacy, to design a new novel programming framework that is flexible enough to enable OpenDP to expand with the rapidly advancing science of differential privacy, while making it easy for programmers to write programs whose privacy properties we can readily verify. Specifically, um, this programming framework allows us to express complex differentially private programs in terms of simple modular components that can be independently verified. We also aim for the OpenDP software to provide statistical functionality that is sufficiently expressive and useful for the researchers who will analyze data through it. In particular, we believe that it is crucial that the library of differentially private algorithms exposes, exposes measures of utility and uncertainty that will help researchers avoid drawing incorrect conclusions due to the noise introduced for privacy. For example, on this differentially private histogram of age and decades, you can see error bars representing 95% confidence intervals on the noise introduced for privacy. A library of differentially private algorithms is not sufficient on its own. And thus our goal is for the OpenDP systems to provide end-to-end -end systems that integrate securely and efficiently with the storage and compute backends and provide, provide user-facing front ends for using differential privacy in different use cases. The first example is the system that I mentioned we are building in partnership with Microsoft, which had a preliminary re release at Microsoft's Build Conference in May. This system allows for computing differentially private data releases from data sources that include SQL, Postgres, Spark, and Presto. We plan for a future version of the system to integrate with the Dataverse data repositories that I mentioned earlier. For the Dataverse use case, we imagine a great graphical user interface that will allow a data depositor with no expertise in differential privacy to set and manage a privacy loss budget across a collection of statistics they want to release uh, to others. And also for other subsequent researchers who come to the repository to view the results of those releases together with uh, measures of uncertainty like I talked about before and possibly make differentially private queries of their own. I've already mentioned the importance of the community built around OpenDP, which extends from a core group that will directly contribute to and use the software to individuals in society at large whose data may be shared and protected using OpenDP software. Specific examples of collaborations we envision are for organizations or individuals to add features and tools to the OpenDP Commons, build an OpenDP system in a partnership with the OpenDP team, provide data of interest to researchers through an OpenDP system, adopt and test OpenDP software, and sponsor OpenDP's work by contributing resources to the project. 
Currently, we on the OpenDP team are absorbing all the feedback we got from our community meeting in May, and we'll soon get to work on building the OpenDP Commons. We are also looking to work with some folks who might be excited to join the team as application leaders, driving efforts to bring OpenDP to novel applications, such as contributing to the battle against COVID-19. We will also establish our model for partnerships and start more collaborations and acquire more resources for our efforts. Come fall, we plan to launch the OpenDP Commons with a working code base for the core library of differentially private algorithms and establish the editorial board and code committers to review contributions. We also plan to have a minimal viable product of a deployable DP system coming out of the collaboration with Microsoft. And along with all of these launches, we plan to have a second OpenDP community meeting, which I hope many of you will attend. Looking beyond, we hope for continual growth in the functionality and applications of the software through community contributions, increased community governance through a steering committee, and sustainability for OpenDP through a community commitment to the project. How can you engage? You can find out much more about our plan evolving plans from our website, opendp.io, which has white papers, videos of presentations, our software repository, and our blog. We welcome your feedback and collaboration ideas at any time. You can also join a mailing list to interact with the rest of the OpenDP community. There will be many more opportunities to engage and contribute as OpenDP develops, and we looking, look forward to having you join our effort. Thank you.